Okay. So as I was saying, um, this is a you know starting point for a lot of AP questions and a, a lot of the uh, questions that you're going to see in the final because again I made made the final from old AP tests. Okay, so um, there's a couple ways to look at it. If we're leaving it the way it is, okay, you can use it to find g values such as g of four, for example, by simply putting the four there and the four there and then taking it from there. So if I do that. This is what I'm looking at. Okay, now. Um, by the way, doesn't doesn't it say that this is a sketch of F right here? So isn't this a graph of F that you're looking at? Okay, and so to find G of four, you need to find this value, which you should all know by now, is the area between F and the x-axis from one to four. Good morning. Okay, so um, so if this is F and I want to find this value, I simply have to find the area starting at 1 and ending at 4, right? So we're talking about all of this area here, yes? Yeah? So you're going to take that area and then you're going to subtract that area because it's below the x-axis, right? All right, now instead of finding this area and subtracting this, can I make it simple by realizing that these areas just cancel each other out? So then it just boils down to finding this area here, and I'll, I'll have my answer. Yes? Okay, and so that's a trapezoid, right? Or you can split it up into a rectangle and a triangle. I don't care. But the bottom line is um, that area is what? What is that area right there? Well, again, I'm just going to use the trapezoid formula. What is it? So it's 1 half, what? 4 plus 1 times, what, 1? And what does that equal? 2.5? Yes? Yes? Okay, is that the answer I gave you? Yeah. Okay. All right, so everybody agree that that's G of 4? Okay. All right, now watch what happens when you do the same thing on B. Okay, there's a problem here. These limits are backwards, right? You can't start at 1 and go to negative 2. That's backwards, isn't it? So shouldn't I fix that? And I can switch the limits anytime I want as long as I do what? Put a negative out front. Is that clear? Yes? Okay. So So now I just got to find the area between f and the x-axis starting at negative 2 and ending at 1. Everybody agree? So if you start at negative 2 and you go to 1, aren't you talking about this area right here, guys? Yes? And what is it? Well, it's just it's a triangle, so we can just use geometry to find it. It's 1 half, what, 3 times 4? So what is that, 6? Okay. So what's your answer here? Negative 6. So if you think about it, I mean, if you're trying to draw a graph of G, this would kind of be one way to do it. I mean, now I've got, I've got two points on G, and I could keep doing this if I wanted, right, and find more and more points on G, couldn't I? Yes? Okay. Um, anyway, all right, so let's stop there and go to part C. All right, before I start C, there's another thing you're typically, typically going to do when they start out with something like this. And that is, um, another way to find out things about G is to look at G prime, yes? Right? Doesn't G prime tell you a lot of things you want to know about G? So how can I get G prime out of this? By taking the derivative of both sides of that equation, can I? So what happens when I do that? Well, if I take the derivative of the left side and the derivative of the right side, like that, okay? 
Again, everybody agree that uh, my red pens just keep disappearing on me. I had two of them yesterday. You see a red pen around there? Okay, um, so again, what I was saying is that, and uh, wait a minute, I just had a red pen. I wrote in red pen. Where'd it go? No, this isn't it, I don't think. I didn't go anywhere. I went to the computer just for a second and I didn't No. Well that was with a different red pen. Yeah. Oh no, it was this one. It was this. I thought this was blue. Okay. Okay, I was gonna lose my mind there for a second. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna look. I was looking for this kind of red pen because I had two of these yesterday, one here and one there. Now they're both gone. But anyway, okay. So that and that indicate I'm taking the derivative. Yes. Okay. So now, once I put the derivative there, this whole thing should look familiar. It's one of the fundamental theorems of calculus, and there was a shortcut for finding the derivative of an antiderivative that starts at a constant and ends at a function. What was the shortcut, guys? What was the shortcut? Well, you put the upper limit into the function, and then you multiply all that by the derivative of the upper limit, which is 1, right? Got it? And so basically what you get out of this is that g prime is the same thing as what? f. Okay? So not only is that a graph of f if you need it to be, but it's also a graph of what? g prime. Okay. So now, focus on the fact that we're looking at a graph of g prime. Okay. And so, again, isn't the area under g prime from any a to any b that the change in g from a to b, isn't it? Let me say that again. The area under the graph of g prime from any a to any b will give you the change in g from a to b. Does that make sense? So with that in mind, we can start here. Even though this starts at 1, it doesn't matter because we're beyond that now. We took the derivative of that and we just know that this is a graph of g prime. So don't be bothered by the fact that this starts at 1 and goes to x. We can still start at negative 2 for what I'm about to show you. Are you with me? Okay, so if I start at negative 2, what happens from here all the way to here? G what? Increases by what? All of this area, yes? Okay, and then what happens from here to here? G what? Decreases by this little amount. So now, based on all that, where will G be at its maximum? At x equals what? 3. Does that make sense? Are you following me? <coughs> yes? Because it goes up by a whole lot and then goes down by a little. So it's bigger here than it was at the beginning as well as here. Yes? You draw it and label this area as area 1 and area 2 and just say G increases by a larger area 1 than, than it decreases by a smaller area 2. Simple as that. Okay, but again, they may or may not ask for you to justify your answer. They just might ask where is it at its maximum, right? And if they ask you to justify, then you justify, okay? All right. All right, now, but we want more than that. We want to actually find the absolute maximum. So here we go. Ready, guys? Okay, so 7C... To find the absolute maximum, we know it's at x equals um, 3. So if you think about it,
the maximum is g of 3. Everybody agree with that? So how do we find g of 3? Well, you can take g of negative 2 and then add the change in g from negative 2 to 3, right? And you should all know by now that this will give you the change in g from negative 2 to 3, won't it? Remember I said that if you go on the AP Calc uh, web page on the College Board website, this is listed as one of the main concepts that you're expected to know for the AP exam. When you integrate the derivative from A to B, it gives you the change in the original function from A to B. Is that clear? Okay, so with that in mind, I think we have everything we need to go ahead and finish this question. Okay, so what's G of negative 2? We found that earlier. What was it? I just found it a minute ago. What was it? Negative 6? Yes? Okay, now this is simply the area between g and the x-axis, or sorry, from, between g prime and the x-axis from negative 2 to 3, right? So, from negative 2 to 3, what's this total area in here, guys? Anyone, can you figure it out? I mean, it's, you know, basically it's what in here? This is, what did we say this was? 6, and then plus, what was this area in here? Didn't I find that earlier? What was it? 2.5, and then, and then this little area in here I found earlier, or no, I can find right now. What is it? What's that little area there? 1.5? Just 0.5. Are you following me, guys? You see what I'm doing? What's wrong? Is this right or not? Okay. So basically, what does this equal? Mm. Three. That's right. What's that? Put three into the original function? Yeah, yes, yes, you could have. You're right. So another way you could have done it, again, the reason I want I to do it this way is I think you understand it um, in another way. You're right, though. Um, just so you guys know, another way I could have found this besides this way, but again, you just depends on what they give you. On the AP exam, you might need to find it this way, depending on what they give you, right? Um, so another way to find it is just to plug it into here, right? Isn't this another way to find it? Just plug 3 in here and plug 3 in there. That, that would have given you the same thing, wouldn't it? Yes? And so... If you do that, you'll get what? 3. Because it's in the area. Is in the um, area under F from uh, 1 to 3 going to be 3? Yes? So either way works. Yes? No, it's just common sense if you think about it. To find a later, remember when I explained this a couple weeks ago? To find a later G value, you could take some earlier G value you might know, like negative 2 and then just add the change in g from negative 2 to 3. And that's, that's what this gives you. This gives you the change in g from negative 2 to 3. Does that make sense? Yeah, don't try and memorize things as formulas. That's when you get in trouble and that's when you forget things. Okay? I mean, does this or does this not make sense? Yes? Yes? Okay? All right. So you could have found it that way. And you really should know that. That's going to come up again on this packet. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Or you could have found it this way. Either way, we'll get you what you need. But the, first, you have to understand that the maximum occurred at 3. That was, that was the first part of this problem. Yes? Okay or not? All right. Again, you guys, if, once we make it through this problem, <laughs> number 7, it's, it's going to go a lot faster. I know, I know this has taken a long time just to get the, through, the, through the first page and the, and the first problem on the second page, but after number 7, it'll start going a lot faster, trust me, okay? All right, so. All right, now I don't think I need to do D and E because, again, now that we've established this is a graph of G prime, I think D and E are pretty easy, aren't they? Yes? When would G be concave down? Whenever G prime is doing what? 
decreasing. So just look at it. Where is G prime decreasing? From what? From 1 to what? 1 to 4. So everybody agree? So the interval of 1 to 4 is your answer for D? Yes? And what's the answer to E? Quick. When X equals what? 1. Because that's where G changes from either increasing to decreasing or vice versa. Yes? I'm sorry. Let me say that again. That's where, G, again, the answer to E is, is uh, 1 because that's where G prime changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. Got that? Yes? Okay, now F is kind of tricky and so is G. So if I can do these two with you, I think you're going to start feeling a lot better about things. So let's look at F. Okay, what you want to do is you want to split it up into this. I can do this, right? Yes? Okay. All right, now this, again, I think I've done this several times by now. What's the area between F and the x-axis from negative 2 to 1? What is that? Was it 6 or negative 6? 6 or negative 6? Just 6. From negative 2 to 1 is just 6, right? Okay. Okay, now this is a very, very easy integral. What's the antiderivative of 2 dx, guys? What is the antiderivative of 2 dx? 2x. Two and then, aren't you supposed to put in the upper limit and subtract what you get when you put in the lower limit? And so when you do that, what do you get, guys? Well, Make sense? Okay. All right, let's look at G now. <coughs> Any questions? I know some of you look like you're racing to write it down, but did you understand what I did? Yeah? Okay. Okay, 7G. Okay, this is H. And we want to find what? H prime of what? A half? Okay, so here we go. Well, before we can find H prime of a half, I first have to find H prime of X. So how do I take the derivative of this thing? Well, it's a composition. Isn't this a composition? So don't I have to use the chain rule? By taking the derivative of the outside, putting the inside back in the way it was, and then finishing the chain rule by multiplying by the derivative of the inside, which you should all agree is negative 2. Correct? Yes? So now, to find h prime of a half, aren't I just going to put a half in there and a half in there? Yes? So doing that, I get this. <coughs> Any questions so far? Any questions? Okay, now, how do I get this? Is there a way, get based on what was given, that I can find, somehow find the value of f prime and negative 1? Is there a way? Look at the graph. Again, this is a graph of f, isn't it? Isn't this also a graph of f? So to find f prime and negative 1, don't I just find the slope at that point right there, guys? Don't I? So what's the slope of that point? Well, the slope of that, at that point is the same as the slope of this line segment. So you can just count the rise and the run to get the slope. What is it? Up 4, right 3. So everybody agree the slope is 4 thirds? So what's 4 thirds times negative 2, guys? Negative 8 thirds. Yeah? Okay? <coughs> All right, now. Now things should start getting easier. Okay, so um, any questions on anything uh, 8 through 11 that you tried and got stuck on? Yes? Um, number 9. Number nine. Okay. 
let's look at number 9. Okay, so this is F. Let's just write down what we know, and then we'll see if we can piece it together. Now, the key here is this right here. What does that say? G is antiderivative of F, right? Yes? G is, in other words, G equals the antiderivative of F. Isn't that what that statement says? Yes or no? Okay, so you, you gotta, you gotta, can't just keep reading and skip right by that. That's obviously very critical for you to catch what that says and what it means. Yes? Okay, and what else do we know? We also know that what? G of what? G of 3 is 5, and I want to find what? G of 1, okay? So now you're going to see why I, I showed you that earlier problem two different ways. Okay, remember when I said you could have done 7C this way or this way? Do you remember that? And obviously this way is easier, but the reason I showed you this is because it's going to come up in other problems where you're going to probably want to do it this way anyway. <coughs> is that clear? So you really should know both ways. Okay, so what I'm saying is this. Um, I want to find g of 1, and I know g of 3. Okay, so here's how it should set up. Again, this is not some formula. This is common sense. Okay, when you're trying to memorize it as a formula, it's not going to do you any good. You're not going to know... You're not going to remember it. You're not going to know what it means. You're not going to know when to use it or any of that. So no memorizing here. Common sense. Ready? To find some later function. When I say later, I mean on the number line later. Is that clear? To find some later function value like g of 3, common sense should tell you you can take some earlier function value, for example, g of 1, and then add the change in g from x equals 1 to x equals 3. Isn't that common sense? Is it or is it not common sense? Yes? Okay, now let me ask you, using calculus concepts, what's one way that I can find the change in g from 1 to 3? By taking the area what? Under what? Under g what? Prime, right? Yes? From what? 1 to 3. Are you following me? Yes? Everybody agree that that's what integrating g prime from a to b does? It gives you the change in the original function g from a to b, doesn't it? Are you with me so far? Still one little trick here. Any questions yet? All right? All right, now, let's go back to this for a minute. Right, I need g prime to put here, don't I? And then I'll be okay? Can I get g prime out of here somehow? Yeah, by doing what? Taking the what? Derivative of both sides. So what do I get out of that? I get the fact that g prime, if I take the derivative of this, I get that. If I take the derivative of that, I get what? F. So isn't g prime the same as f, guys? Isn't it? Isn't it? If I take the derivative of both sides here, I get g prime is equal to f. Okay? And therefore, what can I put right here? What can I replace g prime with there? f, which is what? Square root of what? Yeah, square root of this. Are you following me, guys? That I now need to figure this out and I'll be all set? Yes? Okay, so here we go. And by the way, 9 is a calculator question, isn't it? Okay, so here we go. So what goes in place of this, guys? What goes there? 5. What goes there? Just g of 1. So that's what you're trying to find, yes? Okay. Can I find this somehow? Yeah, on my calculator, right? So here we go. Sorry.
Okay, now what? Now what, guys? To finish solving for g of 1, I do what? Just subtract 6.585 from both sides? And what do I get? G of 1 equals what? Negative 1.585. Okay, does that make sense? And that'll come up again, I believe, um, somewhere else. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe not. Well, it's already come up twice. Yeah, I think you might need it on like number 19. Um, I think you'll need it on number 23. Yeah, I'm talking about this type of concept. Now, I'll, you know, you should be able to do the handle the same thing in some kind of application, right? Right? Like if they wanted to find the number of gallons at some later time, right? You take the early number of gallons at an earlier time and add the change in number of gallons from A to B. It's same type concept, right? So, I mean, this, this concept is going to come up over and over in this packet. It's going to come up over and over on the final exam as well as on the AP exam. Okay? I haven't done, you know, a lot of AP problems. I've, I've, you know, I've given you a small sample, but, you know, we're about... 75% of the way through the curriculum. So this is the time for me to start challenge you, challenging you with the AP stuff because some of you might, you know, might not even want to continue with second semester because it's all AP after the first month or so. It's all AP problems after that. So, you know, I'm trying to, you know, get you set up for that and see if that's something you want to continue with. But anyway, um, hopefully it is. So anyway, any questions? All right, so again, what I want you to do is work for about the next 40 minutes, maybe 35, 40 minutes. Don't spend too much time on one problem, okay? If you're really stuck and you don't know where to go, skip it and go to something you know how to do because, you know, time is really short and you've got a long way to go. You can't be stuck on problems for too long. Obviously, I, I can help you again for the last 15 to 20 minutes of the hour. Okay? Okay, so work. Don't waste any time. Go to work.